Hi, this is Caroline Gentry and Girati. We're here at the EIT Inner Energy Business Booster afternoon of the first day. And I have here with me Chilla Kohami Monfils, who is the Innovation Director at NG Fab. The, I believe that's the Innovation Center of NG. Yes, it's the Corporate Innovation and New Business Center, yes. Okay, well, thanks for joining us today. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you in general um, what you think the, the biggest challenges are for a utility um, at the moment. Obviously, you've got a lot of different regulatory changes coming up and the climate concerns. So, you know, from the innovation point of view, what's the direction you think? Well, obviously, the biggest challenge for us is, uh, you know, the 3Ds. We have been talking about this for a couple of years. Uh, decarbonization, of course, is a big challenge, but so is decentralization and digitalization. Um, in terms of uh, decarbonization, I think NG has been taking the lead and, uh, uh, and we're quite way, way ahead. We have closed down all of our coal-fired power plants pretty much and uh, have uh, big ambitions and big commitments towards uh, renewables. Um, but when we're talking about uh, decentralization, obviously it means the decentralization of the energy infrastructure. Uh, and uh, so we need to become much more um, an enabler of uh, the exchange of energy uh, between our customers rather than just a one-way street of, of providing, uh, of delivering energy. But if we think about, you mentioned the regulatory context, um, uh, we also believe that there's a decentralization not just in the energy infrastructure, but in the whole ownership of the energy landscape. So we see uh, uh, corporate uh, communities, uh, you see the Greater Thunberg movement, there's a lot more people taking ownership of this, of this uh, directive and uh, with the technologies that are emerging they can actually take much more ownership of their energy use, of their energy generation. Uh, and so uh, it's much more the cities who are becoming the, the key players, the cities and the corporates who are becoming the key players of this world uh, rather than federal governments. Uh, and the regulation will have to fo follow this. Uh, today the utilities have this, this dytopia challenge that we are regulated by federal agencies, but uh, the actual action is happen happening at a much lower level. Yes, yes, it's happening very fast as well, isn't yes. it? I mean, it has to. And um, in, in terms of the, the, the changes that are going on, I mean, the, the, this event is called uh, Humanising the Energy Transition. Um, you know, how do you see things changing in terms of the customer and, and how can utilities get the customer more involved? Because I've heard some people say it's quite difficult to actually engage customers. Um, well, I think, yes, this is a challenge for the utility. I don't think it's really a challenge for the customer. So what I've been explaining with this, I, I, we actually see uh, there are customers who are very much involved and here, very much ready for action, but who don't have the means uh, of doing so. They're not energy uh, experts. So we are here to help our customers um, uh, go through their zero carbon transition. And that has been actually uh, coined as our new strategic slogan is that we want to be the, the enablers of the zero carbon transition of the, of the world. Uh, and there are customers mainly being uh, uh, large clients who have um, uh, multiple uh, manufacturing uh, plants around the world, uh, large companies who have uh, uh, made commitments via the RE100 initiative or, or other such initiatives and also um, cities who have taken initiatives to, um, uh, and commitments uh, to go zero carbon in the, in the near future, 2040, 2050, etc. So I think it's not, about, um, uh, it's not about convincing the customers. There's plenty of customers who are already convinced. It's about uh, positioning ourselves uh, as a utility who have maybe a different image from the past, um, that we can actually help them with that and we actually have all of the expertise needed uh, to help them with that zero carbon transition. And how do you think utilities can future-proof themselves? Because, you know, at the moment there are a lot of changes going on, but how do you know, you know, how do you sort of predict the future with everything changing so quickly and digital technologies and some of the technology prices are falling very quickly. So how do you know when's the right time to, to enter the market? Um, well, we need to be very well organized. So. Um, uh, about five years ago that uh, the predecessor of my team was created exactly to be looking into the future and looking at where future technology trends are going and which other adjacent areas are uh, appearing. In this conference we're talking a lot about mobility. Obviously mobility going electric means that utilities have a role to play 
um, and we want to move into these adjacent areas. So we have, uh, on several fronts, we have our research and development team who is uh, really looking at uh, technological developments and, and, and looking at how those play out. The innovation team and, and the, the engineer ventures team who are looking for uh, cutting edge technologies and partnerships with startups who have uh, new technologies. And we have an NG digital team uh, who is looking at the digitalization. Um, the energy industry is still very much a bricks and mortar industry. I mean, there's a lot of uh, assets and very complex, uh, sophisticated equipment. Um, the digital layer, of course, helps us uh, better uh, respond to certain things that happen in the market and helps us better optimize the use of this equipment. And that's very important for us just to increase. Every 1% of, of performance increase in energy means a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, and what are the sort of short-term challenges? So for next year, can you share any of the projects that you might be working on or any of the issues that you're dealing with right now? Um, well, I can share you with you a couple, but of course uh, we have, being the vast scope of the company, we have a lot of different types of projects and a lot of different things that we're working on. Um, every year through our innovation trophies, we get over 500 uh, proposals from our um, employees and more and more uh, co-created proposals with um, the local communities, with the startups, etc. So just to show you the, the vast amount of different things that we're working on. Um, but one of the, the key aspects being an energy company, we have uh, recently created a, uh, a business unit for hydrogen. We do believe that hydrogen is going to be the energy carrier of the future rather than uh, oil and therefore we're spending uh, a lot of money in figuring out how that will work and into the technologies that will make that happen. Uh, and greening our gases, we also have a lot of uh, gas infrastructure so we need to make sure that um, the gas that we supply is going to be greener and greener over time. Um, and like I mentioned, mobility uh, is an important area for us, given that it's uh, going electric and we can supply a lot of mobility solutions. Um, and last but not least, maybe I would mention buildings. So we, we do operate uh, a lot of, lot of buildings and energy performance of buildings, as we've heard today, uh, is sometimes 30 to 40 percent of the energy use of a city. So getting the buildings to become zero carbon and uh, etc. is very important for us. So we're looking at all the technologies to help that. Okay. And in terms of um, today, there's a lot of uh, different startups on display here. Are there any that have you know, stood out as particular, particularly noteworthy, or they're going to be particularly disruptive? That you, uh, I know it's sometimes difficult to name names. But it's difficult to name names, and it's we're only at the. Uh, uh, beginning of the afternoon, the first day, but um, there was one startup that I that I found. As I told you, we are very much a brick and mortars industry. So, uh, what helps us is if we can figure out how that equipment is working. Um, and so, I, once I saw one startup that can uh, detect through uh, a sensor what's happening um, inside the wind turbine blade uh, during operation, and that means that we would have. Uh, uh, better optimization of maybe angling the uh, the wind turbine, uh, better optimi better knowing if something is going to happen so we can do preventive maintenance, um, and just better information about about how that works. So given that uh, the the wind industry is an important industry for us um, and it's an expensive industry, any way to to optimize uh, the dispatch and 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 the preventive maintenance uh, can be quite uh, powerful. Yeah. And do you think 100% uh, renewables is possible, or 90%, or you know, what, what do you see as the sort of upper limit that is possible and for the grid still to function? 100% is definitely possible. Um, the question is where and when. So um, there are countries that are um, better equipped for 100% renewable, given given their climate conditions, um, than others. So this is where the hydrogen comes into play. So uh, in the end, we believe that whereas uh, in the past, uh, the energy was coming from oil, so therefore oil-rich uh, countries were the ones exporting uh, their oil uh, to the rest of the world. We do believe that in the future, sunshine will be exported uh, through hydrogen. Um, so therefore, uh, the countries which are rich in sunshine and wind are going to be the exporters of energy to other parts of the world. Okay, we could certainly do with more sunshine in, in our country. <laughs> yeah. Figuratively speaking, I'm not sure you can get the sunshine, but you can get the energy from it. <laughs> sure. All right, well, thank you very much for joining us today. Very Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.